chapter 1. And as we turn to John chapter 1 before I read the opening verses, we remind ourselves that the Gospels are all about the same object. They all have the same objective. They all point us to Christ. And so as John writes this Gospel, we are reminded that he is going to open for, uh, <clears throat> for us to know a person. And so in the opening verses, we'll find that John opens for us with a person of Jesus Christ. All of the gospel writers are concerned then to pl display for us the glory of God in Christ Jesus, his only son. The Gospel of John is also unique among the other Gospels um, because it begins and opens for us with the heavenly perspective on the person of Jesus Christ. He doesn't start with the birth uh, of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem, but he just does show us that Jesus is a heavenly person. So in John 1, verse 1 to 5, we read the following. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, with the help of the Holy Spirit, we'll see here that, um, that we are told about this person, Jesus Christ, and we will be shown exactly what the Holy Spirit wants us to know about Christ Jesus, about the Word that is revealed to us here. So let us open then with verse 1. Verse 1, John 1 verse 1 echoes the first verse of the whole Bible, which we heard this morning as I read it to you, in the beginning also begins with the same words, in the beginning. So John is the New Testament uh, counterpart to the Old Testament, Genesis 1 and verse 1. In John 1, verse 1, we read, in the beginning. Now, in Genesis 1, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This verse in Genesis 1 reveals to us that in the be beginning, God, an all-powerful spiritual being, spoke the world into existence. He brought the material world into existence by His Word. But before God fashioned the world, before He created all things, we read in, um, in John 1, that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But even in Genesis, when we read in Genesis 1 and verse 2, we see that the earth was formless and without void and a darkness was over the face of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Already in chapter 2 of Genesis, we have a hint at the plurality of persons within the Godhead. God, the Spirit of God, and now in John 1, we read of the Word that was with God and that was God. Where Genesis focuses on the work of creation, the Gospel of John focuses our attention not so much on the work that God did in the beginning of creation, but he focuses in on the God who created. He's not answering the what did God make question, he's asking the question, who is God? Who is it that was de there? Who is it that formed? He's asking this question, what was there before God created the heavens and the earth? If ever you come across someone asking that question, what was there before God created? You can point them to John 1, verse 1, and tell them, this is what was before God created the world. Some of the questions that people may ask, why did God create the world? Was God perhaps lonely when He created all things? Was God this cosmic being who thought, I'm so lonely, I just need some things to play with, so let me create the world. Let me create man so that I may have fellowship. I'm a lonely being, I need this. Did he create all things to fill a void in his own existence? But John tells us through the Holy Spirit in John 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. This was the condition before God created all things, there was the Word. And the Word was with God. The Word revealed to us here 
is a person. This is not an abstract idea. The word with capital letters, the word here is a person that's being revealed to us. The person who was with God, the word. So who is the word? What do we know about the word through this first verse? We know that the word, he is a person. And this person is firstly eternal. This is an eternal person we are talking about. In the beginning was the Word. This person called the Word eternally existed alongside God. In the beginning was the Word. Eternally existing alongside God. God was not lonely. He did not create in, because He was alone. The Word was with Him. He was in perfect communion with Himself. God in communion with this person the Word who was with Him in the beginning. The Word is also a distinct person. The Word was with God. He is distinct from God. The Word and God are two distinct persons, in other words. They can be distinguished from one another. We have God and we have the person of the Word. However, they are also intimate with one another. So we cannot separate them. The Word was with God. God. The word was with God. It shows intimacy. The word with shows that there is intimacy between God and this person, the word. We should immediately note the intimate fellowship between God and the word with that simple word with. Though they are distinct persons, they are inseparable. They are always in communion with one another. The third thing we learn about this person is that he is divine. In verse 1 we read, the word was God. The word is not somehow a person that is subordinate to God as a lesser being. The word was God. The word and God are distinct persons in one divine essence. The word was God. One Reformed commentator says this about the words, In the beginning was the word. He writes, By these words, therefore, the evangelist, John, assures us that we do not withdraw from the only and eternal God when we believe in Christ. We're not somehow worshipping a different God when we're worshipping Christ. We're worshipping the one and the same God when we worship Christ Jesus our Lord as God. We are worshipping. We do not withdraw from the only and eternal God when we believe in Christ. And likewise, that life is now restored to the dead through the kindness of Him who was the source and the cause of life when the nature of man was still uncorrupted. When the Word was with God in the beginning and everything was created by the Word, the Word existed as a person even before the fall of humanity and sin. Some Christians may think that Christ came into existence to save us from our sins, but this is contrary to scriptural teaching, showing us that He's an eternal person existing even before the fall. Christ is not a person that came into being to solve our sin problem, in other words. Christ is very God deserving of our worship because He is the Creator. He was with the Creator. The Word was with God. J.C. Ryle in his expository thoughts on John writes the following. The truth contained in this sentence is one of the deepest and most mysterious in the whole range of Christian theology. The nature of this union between the Father and the Son we have no mental capacity to explain. Explain yourself. We don't have the capacity to explain it. Augustine draws illustrations from the sun and its rays and from fire and the light of fire, which though two distinct things are yet inseparably united so that where the one is, the other one is. But all such illustrations, J.C. Ryle says, all such illustrations are subjects, halt and fail. They're inadequate. We might think, oh, that's a clever illustration to say where there is fire, there is light. And where there is light, there is necessarily a fire. But he's saying this, this even fails to 
plummet the mystery and the depth of understanding God as Father and Son inseparable from one another. J.C. Ryle cautions us, and he does it so rightly. Here, at any rate, it is better to believe than to attempt to explain. Why, oh why, oh man, do you attempt to explain the mysteries of God when you are simply required to believe? We should be more like Job. Put my hand over my mouth. What can I say? Behold my glorious God. John records some instances where Jesus proclaims this mystery of the union between the Father and the Son. And so with this we must be content with the words of Jesus himself explaining to us some of this mystery of his union with the Father. In the Gospel of John, he says in, verse, in chapter 14, verse 9 to 11, Jesus said to him, to his disciples, I think this is to Philip, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. That's how closely Jesus is united with God the Father. Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Do you not believe this? As Jesus asked this to Philip, same question can be asked of us. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Do you not believe that Jesus is the true God who is in the Father and the Father is in him? Jesus continues in verse 10, The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Jesus also says earlier in the Gospel of John, John 10 verse 30, he says this, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. We are encouraged to respond in faith. J.C. Ryle continues in his expository thoughts on John. Let us be fully persuaded that the Father and the Son are two distinct persons in the Trinity, co-equal and co-eternal, and yet they are one in substance and inseparably united and undivided. Let us grasp firmly the words of the Athanasian Creed, neither confounding the persons not adding them and mixing them together so that they're not distinct from one another, nor dividing them in substance, no, nor so dividing them that we, we think that they are two different beings. And then he adds wisely, but here let us stop. Let's not say more than what is necessary for us to say. Let us not explain more than that words of Scripture has explained for us. And I do apologize for quoting Ryle at length but I have to lean on someone who's preached through these things um, because it's very easy to go into heresies and, and various errors if you're not careful with your words when speaking about the Trinity. And I don't want you to, confu to be confused with my words when there are adequate words relaying these things. So what we see then that the Word was God, we read that the eternal Word John 1 verse 1, was in nature and in essence and in substance very God. And that as the Father is God, so also the Son is God. There is then no inferiority in the Word, of God, in the Word to God the Father. The Word, the person of the Word is not inferior or less than the Father. He and the Father are one. There are various heretical teachings with regard to the second person of the Trinity. Now, please bear with me, because some of these names are from ancient history, but you'll recognize the same errors that they hold to today. Many who proclaim to be Christians hold to the same heresies as in the 3rd and 4th centuries when speaking about the person of Christ. The Arians believed. Have any of you heard about the Arians? The Arians believed. The Word is inferior to God. They looked at John chapter 1 verse 1 and they said the Word, the person of the Word, Jesus Christ, is inferior to God. The Sabellians believed there is no distinction between the persons of the Godhead, but that God manifests Himself as the Father sometimes and as the Son sometimes and as the Holy Spirit. So the one God is limited to either showing Himself as the Father or either to show Himself as the Son or either to show Himself as the Holy Spirit. 
We get the same idea with the example that some people hold and says it's like water in the three states. You either have it as ice or flowing water or as a vapor. But you see what they fail to grasp is that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are three distinct persons eternally existing alongside one another. It's not God manifesting himself in different ways and at different times. It's somehow lessening God. The Socinians and the Unitarians believed that the Word was not God, but only a man. A most holy and perfect man, but only a man. Now, as I describe these heresies, some of you might have recognized them in our own time that people hold to these various things. They may have different names today, but they are the same false teachings. There is nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes 1 verse 9 to 10 puts it. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, see, this is new? It has been already in the ages before us. And so these heresies are nothing new, and there will be no new heresies with regards to this. Everything that has been, has been, and will be. We are learning these things so that we may recognize them. So you will probably not remember the name Arian, Sibelius, Socinian, or Unitarian, but you'll recognize, oh, that's false, that's false, that's false, that's false. Because you'll understand the true Christian belief with regards to the Trinity and the person of God. Now we must recognize when we are talking about these heresies, giving it various names, you might be faced with the accusation that, well, this is all doctrine. It's all theoretical stuff. It's all high, uh, high philosophy. But we're not talking about abstract things. We're not talking about abstract philosophies. We're talking about the person of the word. We are asking the question, who was he? What is his nature? We are asking about Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's very important then to be very precise in how we understand him. When we come face to face with these false doctrines, they are not doctrines of abstract theology. We are talking about the person of God. We are talking about the person of God and of his Son. It is a matter of life and death for us to understand who God is and who His Son is, that we may know and receive Him as He revealed Himself to us. We should not somehow look at Him as He reveals Himself and say, well, I can't understand it and don't believe it anyway, or let me explain it in the way that I can grasp. We come to God by faith. Now, some of these ancient heresies are found among us today, and we may know them. I'm going to step on some toes. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, and Hebrew Roots Movements. Now, I'm going to quote for you what they believe about Jesus from their own sources. This is their own statements of faith that they put on their websites, that they say, this is what we believe with regards to the Trinity and with regards to the person of Jesus. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses say they believe about Jesus? They say, we follow the teachings and the example of Jesus Christ and honor him as our Savior and as the Son of God. Thus, we are Christians, they say. However, we have learned from the Bible that Jesus is not God and that there is no scriptural basis for the Trinity doctrine. They deny the Trinity. They deny that Jesus is God. They deny the very foundation of Christian belief. They are not, in fact, Christian. Can you see that not everyone who calls himself a Christian is a Christian? Not everyone that calls himself a Christian is a Christian. What do the Mormons say they believe about Jesus? They state the following in their article of faith. The church's first article of faith states, and this is their first article, we believe in God, the eternal Father, and in His Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost, we believe that they are three distinct personages, not one singular being. They deny the unity of the three persons as one God. They believe in three, three beings. They are not one and the same God, they say. 
Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are not the same God. They're worshipping three gods, not one. They're not worshipping one God in three persons. They're worshipping three gods. That's what the Mormons believe. Now, what do the Hebrew Roots Movement believe about Jesus? They believe in one God, one person in three parts. One person in three parts. That's the same as the Sabellian heresy, where it's one God either as water, a vapor, or ice. He's in the three states. In the structure of the Trinity, they further state, the Father is supreme. The other persons of the Trinity are subordinate to Him. We've just read that there's no subordination within the Trinity. These are not Christian beliefs. This is not part of the Christian faith. Let's turn our attention to verse 2. We got through one verse in 20 minutes. I do apologize. This is going to take long because there's so much contained in these short verses. In verse 2, we must note that we do not have a vain and a useless repetition of ideas. Verse 2 states, He was in the beginning with God. In the beginning was the Word. Okay, verse 2 says, He was in the beginning with God. We know this. Verse 1 told us. But we must know that this is not a vain and useless repetition, but a necessary emph emphasis. When the Holy Spirit repeats something to us so that we may hear it again or that we may read it again, he does so so that we may think more deeply about the words that he has repeated. If you have think that you've plummeted the depths of these words in verse 1, think again. Meditate on them once more. We affirm then that this verse teaches that the word is a person. He is an eternal person. He is not a creature. You see, that's what we missed. We haven't said that he's not a creature. Why is it repeated for us so that we may affirm in this instance, He was in the beginning with God. If He was in the beginning with God, He was with God before the beginning, before God created. He is not created. He is not created. He is not a creature. And again, like we said in verse 1, He is intimate with God. He has eternally existed. He was with God. Before God created the heavens and the earth, and He was with God when God made the heavens and the earth. So now we are talking about the existence of the person before creation, eternally existent. The Word is not a person created by God, but is a person who shares in the qualities of God. We say, in other words, He is co-eternal. Co meaning with an eternal meaning without beginning, without end. He is with God, co-eternal, co-eternal with God. They are the same in essence. The Arian heresy, which I mentioned earlier from the 3rd and the 4th century, states that Jesus was not equal to the Father. Christ did not have the same essence as the Father, only an essence like the Father. Jesus was not God as the Father is God, but Jesus was like God, they say. Jesus was like God, but he was not God. Now, whom of you know the name Athanasius? At least tell me you know the name Athanasius. Athanasius was the church father who answered the Arians in their heresy. And so we have the Athanasian Creed was the church's answer to the Arian heresy in the third and the second and the third and the fourth centuries. And this creed is attributed to Athanasius, and we must note that this creed is part of the ecumenical creeds of all the Christian churches. You cannot claim to be a Christian church if you don't hold to the beliefs stated in the Athanasius Creed. Many of the Reformed churches you'll find, and even some of the Methodist churches and Protestant churches throughout, will have the same confession of faith. They confess the Athanasian Creed together. Because we believe in a triune God. This is truly a Christian confession. The creed reads, Whoever desires to be saved, remember this was published in the year 293 to 373 thereabouts. This is what the church said 
Christians must hold to. This is how we recognize fellow Christians. Whoever desires to be saved should above all hold to the Catholic faith, Catholic here meaning the universal faith, the faith of all Christians everywhere. Anyone who does not keep it whole and unbroken will doubtless perish eternally. Now this is the Catholic faith, that we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity. Neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. For the person of the Father is a distinct person. The person of the Son is another and that of the Holy Spirit still another. But the divinity of the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit is one. Their glory is equal. Their majesty is co-eternal. What quality the Father has, the Son has, and the Holy Spirit has. The Father is uncreated. The Son is uncreated. The Holy Spirit is uncreated. The Father is immeasurable. The Son is immeasurable. The Holy Spirit is immeasurable. The Father is eternal. The Son is eternal. The Holy Spirit is eternal. And yet there are not three eternal beings, there is but one eternal being. So too there are not three uncreated or immeasurable beings, there is but one uncreated and immeasurable being. How are you doing so far? <clears throat> Similarly, the Father is almighty, the Son is almighty, the Holy Spirit is almighty. Yet there are not three almighty beings, there is but one almighty being. Helps to put it in words, right? Helps to put it in words to understand what we're learning when we read the scriptures. So thankful for these confessions that were written in the early church. Thus the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, yet there are not three gods, there is but one God. The Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Holy Spirit is Lord, yet there are not three lords, but one Lord. Just as Christian truth compels us, on the one hand, compels us to confess each person individually as both God and Lord, we are compelled to confess each person, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as both God and Lord. So also, the faith forbids us to say that there are three gods or three lords. We affirm the Father is God, we affirm the Son is God. We affirm the Holy Spirit is God. But we deny that there are three gods. We affirm the Father is Lord. The Son is Lord. The Holy Spirit is Lord. But we deny that there are three lords. It's one God, one Lord. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. Here we get into the section where there's a distinction between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice where the distinction lies. The Father was neither made nor created nor begotten from anyone. The Son was neither made nor created. He was begotten from the Father alone. Here is the distinction. The Father is not begotten. The Son is begotten from the Father. The Holy Spirit was neither made nor create, created nor begotten. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. He proceeds from the Father and the Son. There is the distinction. All three of them were not created nor made. The Father was not begotten. The Son was begotten. The Holy Spirit was not begotten. But He proceeds from the Father and the Son. You can even think of the words of Jesus. If I go to my Father, I will send you the Spirit. He proceeds from me. I will ask my Father and He will send. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. But Christ is the begotten Son. This is my Son with whom I am well pleased. The confession continues. Accordingly, there is one Father, not three fathers. There is one Son, not three sons. There is one Holy Spirit, not three Holy Spirits. Nothing in this trinity is before or after. Nothing is greater or smaller. There is no hierarchy of greater or smaller. There is not a lesser one of the three persons. 
in their entirety, the three persons are co-eternal and co-equal with each other. So in everything, as we said earlier, we must worship the Trinity in their unity and their unity in their Trinity. We can't separate these two. We can't separate the three persons from the one God and the one God from the three persons. We must hold these things almost like the two sides of one coin. Where the one is found, the other is found. In everything, as was said earlier, we must worship their trinity and their unity and their unity in their trinity. Anyone then who desires to be saved should think thus about the trinity. We even read in our own Baptist confession of faith, which agrees by the, to, with the Athanasian Creed, by the way, because it has much of the same words. We read in chapter 2 of, in paragraph 3 of our confession, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. It's just the word person. Subsistences. The Father, the Word, or the Son, and the Holy Spirit of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Spirit eternally proceeding from the Father and the Son, all infinite, without beginning, therefore but one God, but who is not to be divided in nature and in being, but distinguished by, by the particular relative properties and personal relations. Which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him. We'll talk about that last sentence in a minute. The word subsistences here means distinct persons, so we shouldn't be up in arms because of the big word there. Subsistences only means the distinct persons under the same being. It was a word to denominate a separate person under the same being. Three persons in one Godhead. Subsistences does not mean, and this is what I thought when I read the word, immediately this came to my mind, that they each have being in and of themselves. What it means is they are able to exist without the, without the other. The Father does not exist apart from the Son, and the Son does not exist apart from the Father. They are co-eternal. There was never a time when the Son was not. There was never a time when the Father was not. There was never a time when the Holy Spirit was not. So when we talk about subsistences, it's not as if each one has being in and of himself apart from the others. Three persons in one God. If any one of the persons of the Trinity is not co-eternal, then there is no eternal triune God. And this is what we deny. But notice that our confession of faith speaks of the practical implications for the doctrine of the Trinity. The question is, how practical are these things? How practical is it to know God as the triune God? This sounds too theoretical for us. It's too high for us. Our confession says, without the doctrine of the Trinity, we have no real communion with God. Without the doctrine or the teaching of the Trinity, without God revealing Him in this way, without coming to know God as He revealed Himself, we don't have communion with Him. There's no communion with the Father, no communion with the Son, no communion with the Holy Spirit, apart from knowing Him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Without the doctrine of the Trinity, we have no real communion with God. We have no foundation for communion and no foundation for dependence and trust in God. Our confession states, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation? What we believe about God is foundational to Christian life. What we answer when the question is asked, who is God, determines who we are. What we believe about God determines if we are Christian or not. We are not asked to understand the doctrine of the Trinity in logical terms, but we are called to believe in God as He has revealed Himself and therefore to have communion with Him as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Have I lost any of you so far? You're still with me. Verse 3. In verse 3 of John chapter 1, we read of the agency of the Word in creation. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. We read of His agency 
in creation. What agency did the person have? This word that we read of, what did he have? Agency did he have in the creation of the world? We read in these words, all things, all things were created. Everything came about. We see then the agency of the divine word. He is sovereign, possessing supreme power, the creative powers of God. All things owe their existence to the word, to Christ, the creator. We can say Christ, the creator, the word, our maker. The Holy Spirit is teaching us that Christ did not come into existence at his incarnation when he was born in the manger. But Christ was an eternally existent person who was there before the world even came into existence. He existed from eternity. I know I'm repeating this a lot, but I'm repeating it at various places. And every time it strikes us to think in this way about the eternal person of the word because we're not used to thinking about these things we we don't think about eternity in these terms he existed from eternity he existed before all things were created all things are created and exist for his glory all things the finite creation comes from the infinite person the finite, the limited creation comes from the infinite person, the word. The material world, the temporal world comes from the eternal person, the word. Eternity is not only, when we talk about eternity, this is, this is glorious. Eternity is not only a time without end, meaning we look forward to a time without end. Eternity is not just looking forward at a time without end. It's not only time reaching forward in never-ending days, but it is also reaching back. God has no beginning and no end. He is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. There never existed a time when God was not not in the future and not in the past. If you could, if you could travel forward and live every single day that will ever be there, you'll never live a day in which God is not there. Now here comes the mind bending part. If you were able to travel back every single day that there is to travel back in, even before the creation, every single day you could go back before creation. There would never be a time when you would find that there is not a God. How contrary to what our world believes and what wicked people say, there is no God. I dare you, travel forward every day, travel back every day and tell me there is no God. Show me one day where God is not there. You will never discover a day when God was not. We read that this word, without him, not anything was made that was made. Literally, not anything means not one single thing. <laughs> no exceptions. No exceptions. Nothing. Not one single thing. Not one thing came into existence apart from this person. Apart from the word. Not one thing came into existence Apart from Christ. Creation testifies to the eternal word. In other words. Everything exists because of him. Everything that you see owes its existence to God. We owe, owe our existence to God. But not only to God. Apart from the Trinity, we must think of God as triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We owe our existence to our Father, to the Son, to the Holy Spirit. All of it, to all of God. Every creature will stand before his maker. You see, the popular idea by Christians is we'll only appear before the judgment seat of God, and what we think of immediately is God the Father. 
And then we think, okay, yeah, of Jesus Christ, the incarnate Christ who died on the cross, and that's why we appear before him because of his incarnation, his death, and his resurrection, because God has appointed him as judge. But here we see he has the right to be judged because he is the creator of all things with God. And don't forget the Holy Spirit as well. We owe our existence to him as well. The same things that could be said of the Son can be said of the Holy Spirit. We've just read it. Again, J.C. Ryle comments on this verse. He says, This sentence appears to be added to show the utter impossibility of our Lord Jesus Christ being no more than a created being. If not, even the slightest thing that was created without him it is plain that he cannot possibly be a creature himself. If not even the slightest thing in this world was created without him, it means he was not created. It's impossible for him to be a created being if everything that was created came into existence by him. I have various scripture references, but I need to get through. You can look up themselves. Scriptures declares in Colossians 1 verse 15 to 17, that Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made. Without him, the world you live in would not be here. You would not be here. Not one thing exists apart from the eternal word. Nothing exists apart from the Son of God. Nothing can exist apart from him. We owe our existence to the word. We exist through him. <coughs> We would cease to exist without Him. He would not cease to exist without us believing in Him. God existed before any human ever thought one thought. We are dependent on Him. He doesn't disappear. when He's not like the story of Santa where, oh, not enough people believe in Santa, so He's going to disappear. You've seen some of these stories, right? where children are called to believe in Santa so that he can have existence in their midst. Jesus is not Santa. God is not Santa. Even sinful and rebellious existence, even people who exist in a sinful and rebellious state before God would cease to exist when God removes life from them. The very breath that they take to rebel against God, to curse Him, the very ground they stand upon is a testimony to God's goodness to His creature. It is by His patience and His long-suffering that people are even able to continue to rebel against Him. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. How long can you rebel against God? Because he's giving you the resources. If he stops giving you resources, if he stops giving you breath and life, and he can take everything away from you. You only rebel as long as he allows you to rebel. That gives us comfort, right? Because no sinner, no sinner in this whole world can rebel more than God allows them to rebel. What a comfort for the Christian, right? No wickedness is unrestrained in that sense. All wickedness will come to an end when God makes an end to it. All of Scripture testify that we are made by God and that we owe our very existence to Him. God does not cease to exist when people do not believe in Him. We do not need to beg people to please believe in the existence of God. That's not evangelism when we go around begging people to please believe in God. Every man alive, every man, believing and unbelieving, every man alive must ask him, where did his life come from? Every man must ask himself this question, where does my life come from? Where does my soul come from? Where does my life and my breath and everything that I have come from? Where does my very existence come from? Because every man will then acknowledge and must acknowledge that he lives only by the will of his creator. And we've just said the word, Jesus Christ is his maker. 
Jesus Christ is the creator of every man. He will answer to your maker. There are various scripture references. Genesis 1 verse 26 tells us God made us, let us make man. Psalm 33 says the word of the Lord. This is the triune God. The heavens were made and by the breath of his mouth all their host. Psalm 102 also. Hebrews 13 verse 8. Isaiah 45. John 1 verse 1. Isaiah 42 verse 8. John 17 verse 1 to verse 5. We cannot help but confess then with the church of all ages in another confession of faith in the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all the ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of the same essence as the Father through him all things were made for us and for our salvation. What a comforting thought. Through him all things were made. Through him all things were made for us, for our benefit. For us and for our salvation. Romans 8. All things work together for the good of those whom God, whom God loves. And we can trust this because it's the Creator who makes this very same promise. The Creator is also our Redeemer. Through Him all things were made. Through Him, the One who came down from heaven. Through Him, who became incarnate by the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary. All things were created through Him who was made flesh, who was made human. All things were made through Him who was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate. It's the very same person we're talking about. All things were created through Him who suffered and was buried. All things were created through Him who on the third day rose again according to the Scriptures. All things were created through Him who ascended to heaven. All things were created to Him who is seated at the right hand of the Father. All things were created through Him who will come again with glory. All things are created through Him who will judge the living and the dead. All things were created by Him whose kingdom will never end. Whose kingdom will never end. <clears throat> Let's close with verse 4 and 5. Verse 4. Verse 4 reads, In Him was life. And the life was the light of men. In this eternal person, in the word, was life. This life is extended to men. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Men live from God, not God from men. He's not an idol. He's the living and the true God. God does not owe his existence to the mind of man, but man owes all of his existence to God. Again, J.C. Ryle comments, he says, This sentence means that life which was in Christ was intended before the fall. Close attention. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. We were talking in... John 1, we are still talking about before the fall. We're talking about the light of men before the fall. This sentence means that the life which was in Christ was intended before the fall to be the guide of man's soul to heaven and the supply of man's heart and conscience. Even Adam before the fall needed Christ, the eternal word. Even Adam before the fall needed the light that emanated from the person of the word. The Trinity did not come into existence as a result of the fall. The Trinity was there before all things were created. I can see the lights coming on like it did for me in the week. We don't think... And meditate deeply enough on these truths. We don't really understand whom it is we're dealing with. But isn't it marvelous? Isn't it marvelous? You see, we hear these things and our soul 
burns within us because we now understand. We understand something of the Trinity, you see. Our soul burns within us because we believe certain things about God. So before the fall, this light was to be a guide to man's soul. And since the fall of man, it has been the salvation and the comfort of all who have been saved. It is those and those only who have followed Christ as their light who have lived before God and have reached heaven. There has never been any spiritual life or light enjoyed by men. Never. Not before the fall, not after the fall. There has never been any spiritual life or light enjoyed by men excepting from Christ. Any light that man had before the fall, after the fall, is because of the person the word, the person of Christ. He is the eternal fountain from which alone the sons of men have ever derived life. He alone. He alone. Verse 5 says, The light shines in darkness. Here's the first hint at the fall. The light shines in darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. The life was the light of men before the fall, before there was ever darkness. The light continues to be light even after darkness came. Verse 5. The light shines in darkness. The fall did not extinguish the light of Christ. The sin of man did not extinguish the light of Christ. Your sin, your misery, and I can say this with a smile, was not, has not put the light of Christ out. No matter how dark your soul is a result of your sin, no matter how troubling your sins, no matter how deep the troubles of your soul, the light shines in the darkest of dark voids. And the darkness has not overcome it. This sentence means, I love how J.C. Ryle is to the point, and I'm so thankful for his words, the sentence means that the natural heart of man has always been so dark since the fall that the great majority of mankind have neither understood nor received nor lay hold upon the light offered to them by Christ. He's saying the greatest, great majority of mankind through the darkness of their souls do not comprehend the light that's offered to them in the gospel. And this is even true of us. We understand so little of the full light that is offered to us in Christ. We are like people squinting when the sun comes up and we're invited to take in every ray of the sunlight. What do we do? We close our eyes. We squint. We can't help handle all of that light but we're invited to the light shines is present tense the present tense indicates that the light is shining as it has always been shining the light shines the light shines as much as it's shone when John write this the light shines as much as it shined for Adam before the fall the life was the light of Christ continues to shine. The light shines. The present tense indicates that the light is shining as it has always been shining. And it is shining even now. The darkness has not overcome it. That's past tense. And the past tense connected with the present tense shines. Shows us that the darkness has not overcome it. It has never overcome it. And uh, it will never overcome it even now. Because this statement is always true, continuing. Now, some translations use the word comprehend rather than overcome. I think both of them are correct. Both of them can be used. Comprehend here means received, and this is how J.C. Ryle explained it. 
It just means that the darkness has not grasped or received the light. It has never grasped or received the light, and it does not now grasp or receive it. But you see, a refusal to grasp and receive the light is at enmity with the light, threatening to extinguish it. You know, it's at enmity. We want the light extinguished. What, what happens when the light gets turned on and you squint? You shout to your wife who, go, who turn on the light. You say, switch off that light. So you don't want to comprehend the light, but you also want it extinguished. There's enmity there. That's why both senses can be implied here and would be correct. We, however, we are God's people. We receive the light. Not as much as, it, as we could, but enough. But enough to receive the grace of God. And we must pray and ask the Lord for the capacity and the ability to receive more of that light in our soul. We need more of that light in our soul. We believe in Christ and we have been given the right then to be called sons of God. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 3 says, Even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled only to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded their minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servant for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness. God who said, let light shine out of darkness. We read day one of creation. God said, let there be light. Now he's quoting from Genesis 1, let there be light. And he's applying it not to light as we understand it, but to the light of Christ shining in the soul of men. Let the light shine out of darkness has shone in our hearts. You know what light needs to reach us first is not the light that was created that comes from the sun. The light that we think of when we talk about light. The light that is mentioned here that we need that is the light that shines in the darkness of our soul. The light of Christ. That's the first and most important light we need. If I could say it this way, not the light of the material universe, but the light of the Spirit shining in our heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the light we need. How will we have that light, you may ask? Peter helps us to see. 2 Peter 1 verse 16. He says, we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, but we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure we have something more sure than the experience of Peter up on that mountain. The prophetic word, scripture, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. The word of God shines as a lamp shining in a dark place. The word will shine in the darkness of your soul. Open the word so that the light of God may start to come in. A lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Until the morning star, Christ, rises in your hearts. From these scriptures, and I have quoted two others, John 16 and John 5. John 16 verse 13 to 14 and John 5 verse 39 to 40. But from all of these scriptures, we learn that you can come to the Bible, you can come to the Bible in a way without coming to Jesus. You can come to the Bible, you can read the Bible, you can quibble about words, quibble about genealogies, quibble about theology. 
never coming to a knowledge of Jesus. This is what the Pharisees and the scribes did. Jesus had to ask them constantly, have you not read, have you not read, have you not read? They claim to be teachers of God's word and they haven't read. It's not that they don't read. They read it in the synagogues. They hear it in the synagogues every Sabbath day. There's a way that you can come to the Bible without coming to Jesus. I mean, we read of the Jehovah's Witnesses, the Mormons, the Hebrew Roots people. Like, they use the same Bible, but they don't come to God. They don't come to Jesus. You can spend all of your life reading the Bible, studying the Bible, and you can still miss the person of whom the Scriptures speak. However, however, according to what we've read in 2 Peter 1, you cannot come to Jesus without coming to the Bible. You cannot come to the person without coming to the scriptures. You cannot approach the person without coming to the word of God. You cannot come to the person apart from the written word of God. Let's conclude. When we learn of the person, the word, we ask, why learn about him? Why is it important to know these particular details about the word? I've quoted him so often, let's close with his words. J.C. Ryle again says, Let us often read the first five verses of John's Gospel. Let us mark what kind of being the Redeemer of mankind must, needs to be, in order to provide eternal redemption for sinners. If no one less, if no one less than the eternal Son of God, the Creator and the Preserver of all things, could take away the sin of the world. Sin must be far more abominable in the sight of God than most of us suppose. If the eternal God, the eternal God who shares a glory with God the Father from eternity past must die for our sins. Our sins are far more egregious than we often think. We should weep when people say, oh, it's only a little thing. It's only a little white lie. It's only a little bit of, not gossip. It's, see, when we minimize sin, we minimize the need for this glorious person to die for our sin. Because this is where the Gospel of John is leading us, giving us a picture of this eternal person so that we may know whom we have to deal with in the rest of the book. So that we may know the person of Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat>